Hello, everyone. I'm John Phillips with the Center for the History of Physics. Uh, thank you all for attending the very first virtual Trimble lecture. Uh, <coughs> our talk will begin shortly, but first, uh, we have a few items uh, just regarding the format of today's talk. Uh, attendees are all muted, and you will not be able to unmute yourselves. Uh, if you want to submit a question for Dr. Wiseman to answer during the Q&A session at the end, you can use the uh, Q&A function in your Zoom menu. Uh, for anyone streaming this talk on YouTube, uh, you can leave your questions there in either the live chat or the comments, and they will be relayed over to us here. Uh, if you're having any technical difficulties, you can let us know about those in uh, the chat function on Zoom. Uh, these chats will be invisible to everyone except for the moderators. Uh, you can also email Vanessa Bridges at the email uh, address on the screen here. And uh, finally, just as a note, uh, this talk is being recorded and will be made available online at the uh, Trimble Lecture webpage. Uh, AIP.org slash Trimble Lectures and uh, on YouTube. Thank you. Uh, now we have introductory remarks from uh, first AIP CEO, uh, Dr. Michael Maloney, and the director for the Center for the History of Physics, Dr. Greg Good. Thank you so much, John. And I'm really excited about uh, being here today and being with what I believe is a global audience who are joining us for the very first ever webinar Trimble lecture. Um, I'm Michael Maloney, I'm the CEO of the American Institute of Physics. We are a federation that advances the, the success of our 10 member societies and an institute that operates as a center of excellence supporting the physical sciences enterprise. One of the ways we do that is through our efforts to promote the understanding of the heritage of the physical sciences through the work of the Center of the History for Physics, and then also um, through the work of our Niels Bohr Library and Archives. And the Trimble Lecture Series is a key um, uh, strategy in, in really promoting that heritage. And uh, I'm really excited that we're being able to do this virtually today. Clearly, uh, we're all challenged in the way that we do our work at the moment with the global effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. We, like many other organizations, have been working remotely since March 16th. And I'm so proud of how well our team at AIP has managed to continue to deliver on our mission of advancing, promoting, and serving the physical sciences for the benefit of humanity. We've also been looking for opportunities while we're all challenged with the current situation. And I'm so delighted that our history team have identified the opportunity to expand the audience for our Trimble Lecture Series to this global uh, venue. And so I want to thank the team for all the hard work they've done to make today possible. And without any further ado, um, pass over to Greg Good, who's the director for our Center of History of Physics. Thanks so much. And I hope you'll join us at future AIP events. Hi, I'm Greg Good, uh, director of the Center for History of Physics at AIP in College Park, Maryland. Welcome to the Line Starling Trumbull Science Heritage Public Lecture Series. This is the 10th year of these lectures and five years since the astrophysicist Virginia Trimble created the endowed fund that supports the lectures. We usually host these face-to-face -face at the American Center for Physics, but with the pandemic, we have this new impetus to go global and instantaneous. And my sympathies to all those folks uh, in China and Japan and Australia who might be up very, very early in the day to hear this. The Center for History of Physics at AIP is dedicated to preserving and making known the history of the physical sciences. We achieve this mission by encouraging research and scholarship um, by conducting oral history interviews and by enhancing the public appreciation of science and its history. The staff of CHP works with our colleagues around the American Institute of Physics to increase the effectiveness of these activities. And today's webcast is a prime example of that. We have people from a half dozen other departments at AIP who are helping behind the scenes and my thanks go to all of them. Today's speaker is Dr. Jennifer Wiseman. Dr. Wiseman is an astrophysicist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, where she serves as the senior project scientist for the Hubble Space Telescope mission. 
She previously headed Goddard's Laboratory for Exoplanets and Stellar Astrophysics and studies the formation of stars in dense interstellar clouds. Dr. Wiseman served as a Congressional Fellow, Science Fellow of the American Physical Society and elected counselor of the American Astronomical Society and a public dialogue leader for the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She enjoys giving talks on the excitement of astronomy and scientific discovery and has appeared in many science and news venues, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, the BBC, NOVA, and National Public Radio. So thanks very much for agreeing to give this talk today. Uh, welcome, Dr. Jennifer Wiseman. Thank you so very much. I am delighted to join you today. It's a very exciting week for, or month, I should say, for those of us involved with the Hubble Space Telescope mission, um, because uh, it is the 30th anniversary of that mission. So um, I am uh, happy to share that excitement um, with you. So here we go. Um, with our adventure of seeing what the Hubble Space Telescope is showing us, what it has shown us, and what we're hoping to do with Hubble in the future. Okay. It is an honor for me to present the Line Starling Trimble Lecture for the American Institute of Physics. And indeed, I do believe that the Hubble Space Telescope has provided us with 30 years of discovery and awe. I hope you will feel the same way after this lecture, if not already. And we believe we have quite a few years ahead of us of similar types of awe-inspiring discovery. Well, what is Hubble? Hubble is actually an orbiting observatory. It's a satellite in low Earth orbit. It was launched from the Space Shuttle Discovery back in April of 1990. It's about the size of a city bus. It's only about 340 miles above the surface of the Earth, so it's not very far up, but it's high enough to get above most of the Earth's atmosphere so we get much clearer views of deep space. We don't have to contend with the blurring effects of the atmosphere. And the atmosphere of Earth also filters out some types of light, in particular ultraviolet light, which is bad for human health, but very good for astronomy. So by putting Hubble above the atmosphere, we can also do observations in ultraviolet light. Hubble is whizzing around the Earth at nearly 17,000 miles an hour, which means it goes all the way around the Earth every 97 minutes or so. And yet it can keep very precisely pointed on different sources in space because of its, its very good gyroscopes and pointing mechanisms within, within the observatory. And so we've become spoiled over the years with uh, gorgeous images from Hubble that show off uh, its beautiful uh, capabilities of viewing stars and interstellar clouds where stars are forming. This particular image was released for Hubble's 21st, 25th birthday, and it shows the Westerlin II cluster of massive stars recently formed from that surrounding gas, which is ionized by the powerful radiation coming from those recently formed stars. And the winds from those stars can carve out the shapes of columns and bubbles uh, that you can see often in these clouds. And in these denser clouds, lower mass stars continue to form. And we can see uh, those types of regions also with Hubble, particularly looking in infrared light. Why do we have a space telescope? Well, this lecture series focuses on a uh, history of science. So there's a lot of history with Hubble. I can't go into all the details in this talk, but I'll just touch on a few things. Hubble really got uh, going uh, a few decades ago when there was a study led by uh, Lyman Spitzer for the National Academy of Sciences. It was called Scientific Uses of a Large Space Telescope. And that book fueled the momentum for people within NASA 
and other scientific advocacy organizations to go ahead and start uh, working on putting together such a facility. Um, Nancy Grace Roman at NASA headquarters was a pivotal leader in this whole effort. She worked as a, as a, as the director of what was then the astrophysics, uh, um, what became the astrophysics division at NASA headquarters. And she really was a champion for this idea of a large space telescope. And by 1977, she had made sure that there was an announcement for opportunity for scientific participation in such a mission. Now we have to dip back a little bit into history to see that these ideas had been percolating for quite some time. In the 1920s, Holman Obert and Hermann Nordung were also were already describing the idea of having orbiting observatories and space stations. And at around the same time, Edwin Hubble, the famed astronomer himself, was already verifying that we had galaxies outside of our own Milky Way galaxy and that the entire universe seemed to be expanding. Lyman Spitzer then came along and wrote his own piece called Astronomical Advantages of an Extraterrestrial Observatory. Uh, such advantages would be to uncover new phenomena not yet imagined and perhaps to modify profoundly our basic concepts of space and time. And that is exactly what the resulting large space telescope, named the Hubble Space Telescope, has done for us. There are, of course, many other champions along the way who advocated for the idea of supporting a large space telescope, particularly to the federal government and the taxpayers. These included not only Lyman Spitzer himself, but John Bacall and George Field, and as well as, as quite a few other champions for the cause. Now, what that telescope might actually look like <laughs> uh, varied over the years as the concept became more mature. And in early concepts back in the 1960s, the idea was that the astronomer would actually travel up to the orbiting space telescope and do the observations in person. Now, as an astronomer myself, I would love the chance to be transported up to Hubble to observe through it. But this concept quickly became uh, apparent that this was really not practical, not realistic, and not necessary, that you could actually transmit commands to an orbiting telescope from the ground, uh, telling it where to point and how to collect light, and then have that data transmitted uh, back to the ground. Here were some of the key issues that were uh, um, hot topics in astronomy when Hubble was being designed and, and the hopes were that Hubble would help address some of these issues. One of the primary drivers for the Hubble, what became the Hubble Space Telescope was to get a better measurement of the rate that the universe was expanding. Edwin Hubble had found out that this was in fact happening, but the uncertainty in that rate was something like a factor of two. So could we get more precise measurements of the distance scale of the universe and use that to help us understand the expansion rate? That was a, a prime goal of Hubble. Also the properties and distribution of gas around and between galaxies, so-called intergalactic medium. The question of whether there are in fact supermassive black holes lurking in the nuclei of galaxies. And, and if so, what would be the relationship of these two active galactic nuclei and these quasars, these distant, uh, very bright objects in the universe? What about the properties and evolution of star populations in our own and other galaxies? And what are the structure and properties of these regions where stars perhaps may still be forming? And even in our own solar system, there was curiosity about the properties and the long-term, what you would learn from long-term monitoring of planets, comets, and asteroids. So at last, after some delays, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched uh, from the Space Shuttle Discovery in April of 1990. And after all the buildup and all the excitement, the first images from Hubble were out actually disappointing. They were not the sharp new views that we had hoped. They were not useless, but they were not what had been advertised. 
This was a huge disappointment to astronomers. It was a big embarrassment to NASA and Hubble even became the object of uh, national disdain and jokes. So this was not a good situation. It was not a good start for the Hubble Space Telescope. However, already from the beginning, there had been a plan to send the space shuttle back to Hubble for repeated servicing missions. Astronaut servicing of the observatory has in fact enabled repairs, enhancements, and mission life extension. The whole design of the Hubble Space Telescope required an intimate pairing with space shuttle missions, not only for its original launch, but to keep it uh, operating and uh, facilitated for years to come. And so the first planned servicing mission was quickly focused on doing something to repair the vision of Hubble. It seems that the Hubble mirror was nicely produced, but to a slightly wrong shape, producing something called spherical aberration in the images. Engineers, technical experts, people on the ground worked very hard to find a fix for this. And in fact, they did. The astronauts on that first servicing mission in 1993 brought up a new camera, the Wide Field Planetary Camera 2, which had corrections built in. They also brought in a, an instrument called COSTAR, which would correct the optics for the other instruments along the path. Basically, these instruments built in errors in their own optical uh, a path so that it would compensate for the error in the mirror and produce uh, very good results. So um, here's the difference between the image of Galaxy M100 from the first camera originally on Hubble and then the next camera with corrective optics built in and you can see the obvious difference. So since 1993 the data from Hubble are all very good although we did get some good data even in those intervening years. And astronauts have returned several times. In fact, five times since Hubble's launch, astronauts have returned uh, on these repeated servicing missions throughout the years, each time um, either replacing or repairing equipment, some of it, some of the, uh, the enabling equipment, solar arrays, gyroscopes, batteries, and sometimes replacing science instruments with new and improved science instruments, new cameras, new uh, spectrographs, things of that nature. The last and final space shuttle servicing mission that we did was in 2009, and that mission was extremely successful. The astronauts, uh, this mission had been uh, even canceled for some time, but reinstated, and so it had been uh, quite delayed, but when we were able to do it, uh, we were so pleased with the results we have uh, now on Hubble since that mission, a wonderful suite of science instruments. Here's the last crew of astronauts that went up to Hubble in 2009. Um, they took out the wide field planetary camera too that I just told you about and brought it back and it is now in the National Air and Space Museum. They also took out the COSTAR instrument, which was really not being used anymore and brought it down. It's also in the National Air and Space Museum. They put in a new camera, the Wide Field Camera 3, uh, which is there now, as well as a new spectrograph, the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph. They repaired the Advanced Camera for Surveys. They repaired the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph. So right now we have actually three cameras and two spectrographs on the Hubble Observatory. Uh, we're using two of those cameras and both of the spectrographs. Of course, it takes more than astronauts. There were hundreds of people on the ground who facilitated all these servicing missions, both engineers, technicians, but also managers and political leaders, and of course, an enthusiastic public and lots of science communicators, all working in concert to make sure these servicing missions took place, were supported, and were successful. A lot of that involves tool making. Here are some of the engineers at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center showing off a particular tool designed for the astronauts to use, even if they're wearing these bulky gloves when they're in their extravehicular activity spacesuits. And by using these tools, they could do intricate repairs, things perhaps never designed when these uh, instruments on Hubble were first put together. On this final space shuttle servicing mission, for example, they had to remove 
uh, 111 little screws, little bolts from the cover of one of the instruments on Hubble to get into the electronics where they could replace some electronic board. Well, how do you do that? You need a special kind of a power driver, if you will, and other equipment to keep those little screws from flying off into the telescope. So these people are heroes too, these people on the ground who develop specialized instrumentation for very particular tasks on Hubble servicing missions. The astronauts return safely, thankfully, from the final servicing mission, and now we're left with an observatory even 11 years after the last servicing mission, Hubble is in wonderful technical condition. The instruments are all working. We have a, a good handle on the health of the gyroscopes and batteries. We have a ground crew that's of, of engineers, technical experts, and project leaders who are paying careful attention to the health of the observatory, uh, even from the ground. And so we're actually getting more science return out of Hubble now than ever before, and we have uh, uh, high hopes for the coming years throughout this decade. Here's an example of what you can do with Hubble. This is one of the first kind of calibration images for the newest camera, the Widefield Camera 3. It's the uh, inner part of a globular cluster of stars in our own galaxy. But you can see how with getting the high angular resolution of a space telescope, you can actually differentiate star from star in a crowded region like this and really uh, uh, see, first of all, the beauty of how stars can look and how different they are. Some are red, some are blue, some are white or green. Uh, if our sun were in this dense kind of cluster, we would look like one of the smaller stars in here. And of course, uh, scientists go on and differentiate these stars by where they appear on, let's say, the color magnitude diagrams that we use and can discern the age and sometimes the composition of these stars. So having a high quality telescope provides great beauty and also provides us with better uh, science than we could ever do before. And we see lots of these vibrant star forming regions. Here's another one, one of my favorite images from Hubble in GC 3603, where you again see a, a massive cluster of stars with the remains of the gas cloud out of which it formed. And of course, the stars themselves are ionizing and lighting up that gas. Here's a kind of graphic of the telescope. You can see the solar your door there at the back. You can see where the fine guidance sensors are and the various science instruments, uh, two spectrographs, uh, several cameras. Hubble is in good technical condition at the peak of its scientific return and we call it an observatory because astronomers can choose which of these instruments are best suited for the particular type of observations that are needed for a particular investigation. Here's an example of what you can do with a spectrograph. I mean, we're all familiar with the pretty pictures from Hubble, but the spectrographs are very powerful scientifically. Um, here's an evolved star system called Eta Carina. It it's, has lots of little eruptions over the years. What's going on and what's in that material that's being expelled into the surrounding space? Well, with a spectrograph, you can take the light, spread it out into its constituent colors or wavelengths, and get a handle on what types of elements are emitting the light. So here we see uh, helium, argon, iron, nickel, uh, for example, in the material that's been produced in that star system and is being expelled into interstellar space. This is the STIS spectrograph producing this data. Hubble also has what we call panchromatic capabilities. It can observe visible light that we see with our eyes, but it also observes invisible in an ultraviolet and near-infrared light. So here's the famous Eagle Nebula observed by Hubble in the 1990s, and now in this image you see a later image with the newest camera on Hubble. It shows the majest majestic columns of dense gas and dust that are carved out by stars that have recently formed in this region off the top of this image, but the winds from that those stars are carving out blowing away the less dense gas, leaving behind the denser material in which lower mass stars, which take longer to form, may still be forming. These are wonderful to see, but because we can't see through the dust in visible light, we can't see in the column to see where those stars are actually forming. 
But if you add on the camera's infrared light capability, you can see through a lot of that dust. So here we have side by side the visible view on the left and the infrared view on the right. And of course, this is the same region, but on, with the infrared view, you can see through a lot of that dust, see many more stars that were previously veiled by that dust and see into those columns where you see bright spots, hot spots where protostars are forming, in particular at the tips of these columns, which are dense globs of gas and prime spots for star formation to continue. As a general purpose great observatory, Hubble explores the universe both near and far in many different regimes. Hubble is looking at the solar system, it's looking at stars, it's looking at planets around stars other than our sun, we call those exoplanets. It's looking at galaxies beyond our own Milky Way. It's looking at the material between stars and between galaxies, the interstellar and intergalactic medium. It's even looking at the universe as a whole um, by studying different aspects of it. We call that cosmology. I don't have time, of course, to tell you about every kind of observation Hubble has done, so I'm going to try to show you some examples from these different categories. Let's start close to home. Here's a beautiful image of Jupiter in our own solar system. Hubble has shown us that our solar system is dynamic, one of the most Memorable images from Hubble was in its early years when Hubble imaged the impacts of comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 into the atmosphere of Jupiter and leaving very visible bruises, if you will, on Jupiter's surface. That told us right off the bat that our solar system is dynamic and interactive. Now we're looking back at Jupiter and other planets regularly with Hubble through a program called OPAL, the Outer Planet Atmosphere's Legacy Program. You can see the beautiful bands of Jupiter in this Hubble image and the big red, uh, great red spot, which we know is a giant storm. Hubble has discerned by looking at these planets over the years, changes in the atmospheres of planets, that the weather changes. And in fact, on Jupiter, for example, that great red spot is shrinking. Um, it is, uh, uh, changing colors a bit and other storms are cropping up. We can even um, look at Hubble in ultraviolet light. So I'm showing you the visible light picture of, of Jupiter, but when we look with Hubble's ultraviolet light camera, we see energetic light that shows up at the magnetic poles. So here we see the northern lights, if you will, of Jupiter lighting up. And if we get this going, you'll see how the northern lights jump around there, the aurora, if you will. This is showing us the dynamic activity of Jupiter's strong magnetic field. And right now we actually have a, um, we have a probe at Jupiter right now, the Juno probe that is orbiting Jupiter, measuring its gravi gravitational and magnetic field, among other things. And so we can correlate Hubble observations with Juno in situ observations and really get a better understanding of what's going on um, in the Jupiter system, which I think is a wonderful use of, of uh, complementary work between a probe and the Hubble Space Telescope. We try to do that as much as we can. I've shown you star images within our own galaxy, but we're also, of course, looking at other galaxies. Uh, this is a galaxy I kind of pulled at random out of the Hubble archive, but it's a beautiful galaxy, uh, a, a nice grand spiral. There's probably hundreds of billions of stars in this galaxy, and Hubble's vision is very good. So if you look carefully around the outskirts of this galaxy, you'll see other background galaxies. And there's so many stars in the middle of this galaxy that the light all uh, collects and you see a, a glow there. But Hubble has helped us understand that galaxies are plentiful. Um, they're also uh, active over the ages. Hubble started imaging early on these interacting galaxies and it turns out that Hubble helped us understand that galaxies merge with one another from time to time. While the tendency is for galaxies to move apart from each other with the expansion, the stretching of space, if galaxies are close enough, their mutual gravitational pull will win and they will be drawn together and merge. Here are two galaxies in the 
caught in the act of merging. Here's two more farther along in the process. That process creates a lot of turbulence, which in turn incites a lot of very active star formation. So this is basically a burst of star formation uh, excited by the merging of this pair of galaxies. Now, uh, um, this may seem like something far, far away, but it's actually relevant to our own galaxy. It turns out that most galaxies in our current epoch are products of multiple mergers. Galaxies build up in mass over time, over billions of years through these mergers, and we're not done. Um, our own Milky Way is still interacting with surrounding satellite galaxies, and the large uh, grand spiral, the Andromeda Galaxy, is moving toward us. In fact, Hubble observations have confirmed that we're kind of on a head-on collision course with Andromeda. Uh, fortunately, it looks like that won't happen for a few billion years, and even when it does, uh, it doesn't look like from models that individual star systems get messed up too much, but certainly the night sky will look different to us in a few billion years. Hubble has discerned that galaxies fill the universe. Uh, this is really my favorite image from Hubble and it's many people's favorite. This is an image uh, created by pointing Hubble in a direction of space where there are no nearby stars, bright stars to drown out the image. And instead, by collecting light many days, Hubble has collected the faintest light from the faintest objects in the field. And so what you see here is the resulting image. The smudges of light are galaxies. There's a couple of foreground stars, but almost every other smudge of light you see is a galaxy. Um, even the little tiny, tiny bits of light here. These are galaxies. Each one can contain billions or even hundreds of billions of stars. Some of them, if you look closely, look like spirals, um, some more spherical. And of course, some are closer than others, some are farther away. And if you imagine this extrapolated over our entire sky, this is what our universe looks like. Now, of course, some of these galaxies are closer to us and some of them are farther away. And so one of the, the most challenging but rewarding tasks for astronomers is to discern distances and in particular discerning distances to galaxies is crucial for helping us to understand the history of the universe. When we look at galaxies, we are of course seeing them as they were when the light began its trek across space to get to us. And so we're looking at these galaxies not as they are today, but as they were when the light began its journey. The galaxies closer to us in space and therefore time are bigger and more well-formed. But as we go through this little simulated fly through of the, the ultra deep field image, we're getting to galaxies that are more distant in space and time. They are in their earlier stages of life and you see they are smaller, they're not well formed, they're less massive, and there seem to be fewer of them as we get closer to the beginning of the universe. Now there aren't really fewer, but it's just that we can't see most of these galaxies beyond a certain point because their light, as, they, as the light travels across expanding space, gets stretched into infrared wavelengths that Hubble uh, cannot see. So we're looking forward to the James Webb Space Telescope to see even earlier galaxies. But from the galaxies we can see in the field, if we pull them out and line them up by their distance, we see that the most distant galaxies, which are lined up here on the right, are small and less mature. The galaxies that have had billions of years of time to merge with others and grow appear toward the, to, toward the left here in those circles. You see they're bigger. Uh, many of them have more well-formed, established shapes. And if you can measure the composition of the stars in these galaxies, you see that over time, generations of massive stars have come and gone in these galaxies and these stars create heavier elements, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, iron, that gets dispersed into the interstellar medium. It gets uh, uh, caught up in subsequent generations of stars. So the compositions are richer in galaxies closer to us in space and time. We really can see with Hubble visually that the universe has changed over time, that galaxies have changed, grown, matured in their composition um, enabling star systems like our own to exist in our own epoch of time in the Milky Way. 
And it even enables the, pre the, the existence of solids and formation of planets around stars in our own epoch, and even the support of life on at least one planet. And we've been able to see this kind of evolutionary progression of the universe through Hubble's uh, deep field imaging. Hubble's scientific impact has been profound. We've done well over a million observations since it's launched. The observations are the, the basis for many scientific papers, over 18,000. And the observations from Hubble are kept in a robust archive. And so these days, many scientists look to the archive of Hubble data to answer questions they have without even needing new observations. So about half of the published peer-reviewed papers coming out of Hubble now are based on data taken from Hubble's archive um, and about half uh, from newer observations, some with a combination. That's good news. That means we're getting at least double the bang for the buck um, for, with Hubble observations. And it means that Hubble discoveries will continue for perhaps decades after the Hubble mission actually ends. The major discoveries from Hubble include verifying the existence of supermassive black holes in the cores of galaxies, um, verifying that the universe is not only expanding, but refining the measurement of that expansion rate to much higher precision, and also in recent years, detecting along with ground-based telescopes that that expansion is accelerating. I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, seeing the most distant galaxies ever seen in the universe, measuring for the first time the chem chemical composition of exoplanetary atmospheres, and even discovering the, the concept that there are in fact protoplanetary disks around other stars as a common phase of star formation where planets are likely forming. And of course, these regions are being studied heavily now with other telescopes as well. Those were, uh, many of those things I just mentioned were things expected with Hubble with the exception of the, uh, the accelerating universe. But Hubble is also investigating big questions now and discoveries about the universe, making discoveries now that were originally unanticipated. Hubble is addressing, for example, questions like what is dark energy? What is it that's causing the acceleration of the expansion of the universe? What is dark matter and where is it? Um, are there planets like Earth orbiting other stars? Um, what are the dynamics of our solar system that we didn't expect? And can we actually see something, radiation from the sources of gravitational waves? I'll, I'll mention a few of these. Let's start with the last one. A few years ago, the LIGO detector on the ground finally uh, received for the first time a measurement of gravitational waves, a signal of a distortion of space-time passing through distant space, being measured. This is not ra electromagnetic radiation. This is a distortion of space-time, a, a, a result of acceleration of mass, and in this case, a, a merging of black holes, as in the artist's model, the conception on the left, and the actual signal detected on the right. Now, Hubble cannot detect gravitational waves, but if there is a gravitational wave source that is um, that also creates electromagnetic radiation, then there's a chance for Hubble to see it. And that also happened um, when LIGO detected a gravitational wave uh, source that also incited a kilonova explosion. This was from the merging of neutron stars and Hubble was quickly focused on this region of an external galaxy. You see Hubble's image of the galaxy there and then blown up there are three snap three uh, uh, blow ups of the actual kilonova explosion that was uh, evidence of the source of the gravitational waves that LIGO picked up. And you can see it fading there as the days go on. So this is very exciting to use Hubble in complement with other types of detectors detecting very, uh, very unusual uh, phenomena in the universe. And we expect that Hubble will be looking in on many more of these gravitational wave sources in years to come. Hubble is looking at gravitational lensing. Um, it turns out that matter in space distorts space-time 
And the most matter, most of the matter is dark matter. We can't see it, but because there's a lot of matter, especially in clusters of galaxies, it can actually distort space enough that light traveling through that distorted space gets itself distorted and magnified. So here you see a Hubble image of a cluster of bright galaxies. And if you look carefully, you see these kind of arc-like features throughout the image. These are distortions of light from background galaxies behind the cluster. And as that light travels through this cluster and through the space that's being distorted by the dark matter here, you see these gravitationally lensed uh, images. And the lensing tells us two things. Astronomers are using the lensing to tell us about where the dark matter is distributed um, in the cluster by looking and modeling of, uh, the actual distortions of light. And then if you look at the actual distortions, the actual distorted galaxy images, such as this snake-like thing here, you can actually see that they've been magnified as well as distorted, and we can learn more detail about the background galaxy than we could if it weren't magnified. And in fact, we're seeing some of these lensed galaxies that we wouldn't be able to see at all were it not for nature's uh, lensing. So astronomers are using Hubble's uh, uh, sensitivity as well as nature's gravitational lenses to tell us about dark matter and to also tell us about very distant galaxies that are being magnified so we can actually see structure in some of these very, very distant galaxies um, billions of light years away. These are galaxies shining to us from the infancy of the universe. Closer to home, Hubble is analyzing exoplanet atmospheres. That's not something that was really envisioned when Hubble was being designed, but Hubble became the pioneer of this technique of looking at atmospheres from planets as they transit in front of their parent star. It's not easy to image an exoplanet. They're usually very small and hidden in the glare of their parent star. But when a planet transits in front of its parent star, some of that starlight comes through the atmosphere of the planet and onto Hubble where the spectrographs on Hubble can spread out the light uh, into its constituent uh, wavelengths and see what kinds of light, what wavelengths are being absorbed by the exoplanet atmosphere. By, this, by pioneering this technique, Hubble has found uh, elements like sodium and is now finding even water vapor in many exoplanets. The exoplanets themselves nowadays are discovered by other telescopes. Uh, the Kepler telescope discovered thousands, telescopes on the ground discovered many exoplanets, and now the TESS satellite is, is scanning the skies for exoplanetary systems, but Hubble is very good for following up and looking at the atmospheric composition. Here's an example of a spectrum from one of these exoplanets where you can see by combining data from Hubble with data from the Spitzer Space Telescope that goes down into the infrared wavelengths of light beyond, beyond what Hubble can see, you see evidence of not only uh, uh, sodium, but also hydrogen, helium, and water and carbon dioxide. We're continuing to refine our understanding of the expansion rate of the entire universe. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is being used in very uh, innovative ways to measure the distance to Cepheid variable stars and then comparing uh, Cepheid variable uh, brightnesses, uh, calibrating that with uh, supernovae in nearby galaxies, and then the supernovae themselves can be used as what we call standard candles to help us understand the distances to very distant galaxies when we see a star explode. So refining this distance ladder is going on, and that's helping feed into our understanding of the expansion rate of the universe throughout time. The surprise a few years ago was by when by comparing measurements with Hubble with measurements from telescopes on the ground, it was realized that the expansion rate of the universe has not been slowing down throughout cosmic time as had been expected, but is actually speeding up in the last few billion years. It was thought when I was in graduate school that the universe would either be drawn back on itself through the gravitational pull of the matter in the universe, or at least slow down in its expansion what would cause it to actually start speeding up? Well, this is the phenomenon uh, known as dark energy. It kind of tells us there's a cosmic tug of war between the matter, most of it dark matter, trying to pull things together and whatever dark energy is trying to pu push things apart 
and in recent epochs of time, the dark energy is winning that battle. Um, the detection of this dark energy, or the, or at least the ex the accelerating expansion, resulted in a Nobel Prize for these three uh, gentlemen. But now we don't quite understand exactly what dark energy is. Now the dilemma now, or, or it's kind of a delicious issue, but uh, by measuring more and more the expansion rate of the universe, that uh, rate seems to be in our current universe of about 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec uh, seems to be at odds with what measurements of the early universe by the Planck satellite would predict. That satellite and the models come from, from its observations would predict a number more like 67 or 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So why the discrepancy? That's a hot topic now feeding further, uh, further investigations of the expansion rate of the universe over time. Closer to home, Hubble's doing unexpected things like studying the first known interstellar objects passing through our own solar system. So Hubble's been used to study uh, Oumuamua, this rock-like thing whizzing through the solar system, and more recently, Comet Borisov, which seems also to be on a trajectory that started from some other star system. This comet is very ca carbon-rich, which tells us something about the environment of the star system from which it came. Now, Hubble is following up doing these studies uh, from observations taken with other telescopes. So again, this uh, brings me to emphasize that Hubble's capabilities complement those of other ground-based and space-based observatories and probes. One of these we're looking forward to is the Webb telescope. So um, the Hubble Space Telescope right now is continuing with strong scientific capability. It's in good technical health and will likely continue through the 2020s and hopefully maybe even beyond. And its scientific capabilities will complement uh, those not only of current missions and probes, but also of future missions like the James Webb Space Telescope uh, due to launch in 2021. I'll say a little bit more about that. There's Hubble in the clean room at Goddard Space Flight Center. It's still going through testing now in California. Um, here's a comparison of the two. Hubble uh, sees, uh, as you see along the bottom there, uh, in the visible light and even beyond blue into the ultraviolet part of the spectrum and a little bit into the near infrared part of the spectrum. The Webb telescope does not see uh, too much invisible light, but it sees farther than Hubble into the infrared part of the spectrum. The Webb telescope has a bigger mirror. In fact, it has to be segmented. Um, it will be a very sensitive telescope and it will help us in particular to complement Hubble's observations by seeing very distant galaxies and also seeing into star and planet forming regions in our own. Um, and Webb will be a long way away. So whereas Hubble is about 340, 350 miles above planet Earth, uh, Webb will be about a million miles away. So no space shuttle missions out there, but it should be very cold and enhance uh, Webb's sensitivity as it is out in a Lagrange point called L2. I'm gonna finish with just a couple of minutes of inspirational thoughts here. Um, this is the cockpit of the space shuttle where um, the astronauts uh, were looking out during the last servicing mission for Hubble. You see Hubble out the window there um, as it's being docked with the space shuttle during that mission and in the foreground, is something brought up by astronaut John Grunsfeld. He brought up this model of Galileo's telescope from four centuries ago. So here you can see the juxtaposition of Galileo's telescope and then four centuries of development of optics and technology to enable us even sharper images from Hubble. But both of these instruments opened up the eyes of the people of the time to a universe much richer than ever imagined before. And in fact, Hubble images are loved around the world. We see Hubble images on all kinds of magazine covers, music covers. Um, it inspires art, poetry, music, postage stamps, um, and uh, museum exhibits, even clothing. Hubble inspires all of us in different ways. It inspires us scientifically, of course, but also in other aspects of human purpose and meaning. 
This is one of the stained glass window, windows in a church very near Johnson Space Center in Texas. And the windows, the stained glass windows in the church are inspired by Hubble images and draw in light and draw the, uh, the people inside the church to look up, to look out and have their spirits uh, lifted by these images. We have also made images available to people who might not be able to enjoy them with their eyes. We've actually coded Hubble images with tactile uh, covering so that people with visual impairments can feel differences between nebulae and stars and galaxies and planets. Here's a student from Maryland's Institute for the Blind. Um, and when I spoke to this class of students, they were uh, very excited about what they were uh, seeing through touch in these Hubble images as other people are by seeing with eyes. Hubble also inspires popular culture. Here's a U-Haul truck with the Hubble Space Telescope right there on it. And hey, there's a Hubble tattoo. So uh, lots of people find ways to celebrate Hubble. If you want to learn more about Hubble, you can go to our All Things Hubble website, nasa.gov slash Hubble, um, or uh, hubblesite.org, which has a great gallery. There's a European site because Hubble is actually a, a cooperative mission between NASA and the European Space Agency. So you can go to spacetelescope.org and we're very active on social media at NASA Hubble. Hubble also inspires us as we think about our own planet and where we fit into the universe. So here's an image from the space shuttle during that last servicing mission, watching the sun rise over the limb of Earth. Now we don't observe Earth with Hubble, but this view from the space shuttle shows us the beauty of Earth's fragile little atmosphere. You see that blue wisp of Hubble of the Earth's atmosphere reminds us that we live on a beautiful planet and we should take care of it. And we're part of a beautiful universe. I wanna leave you with this image we just released last week. This is an image from the Hubble Space Telescope released in honor of its 30th anniversary. It's a very active and vibrant star forming region in the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is this little satellite galaxy to our Milky Way. And on the right, you see this vibrant region where stars at least 10 times more massive than our sun are forming and are starting to light up and ionize the surrounding gas. There, some of the gas is heated uh, to uh, uh, enormous temperatures. That's causing the blue light there, which is heated oxygen, the red light rec re represents nitrogen and hydrogen. And you see from the winds of those stars, little bubbles and ridges being carved out. On the lower left is a nebula formed from one star, a very massive wolf rayet star that's about 200,000 times brighter than our sun. As it periodically ejects part of its outer atmosphere, you see it as this hot nebula and all of this region reminds us that our universe is dynamic, it's fruitful, and it's beautiful and inspirational. And it's the Hubble Space Telescope enabling us to see this kind of beauty and activity in detail that was never possible before it. So with that, um, I hope you've been inspired by what you've seen today from the Hubble Space Telescope. This year is the 30th anniversary of Hubble. Uh, but we anticipate Hubble to be bringing good, good science discovery and good inspiration for years to come. So let's all wish happy, Hubble a happy 30th birthday. And with that, I thank you very, very much for your attention today. Thank you very much, Dr. Weissman. Uh, as uh, I said at the beginning, we'll now have a question and answer uh, period. Questions are still open, so um, if you do have questions, please uh, enter them into the Q&A uh, window, not the chat window, and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can in the time we have. Uh, so our first question, Dr. Weissman, um, was it just a coincidence that of all the great uh, observatories, the Hubble was the only one designed to be serviced and that in fact needed to be serviced? Uh, that's a very good question. So. Um... Again, the Hubble Space Telescope was always designed to be serviced by astronauts. So that was, was not something that was just scrambled and thought of after the error in Hubble's mirror was detected. However, the purpose of the first servicing mission was certainly refocused when we realized we needed to do something to correct Hubble's optics. 
So I, uh, I suppose that it, it perhaps was some kind of uh, coincidence that the first serviceable telescope was the first one that needed servicing. Although if you look through history, you'll see other, even before Hubble, other, um, other lesser known space observing platforms that were launched from the surface of Earth, some on balloons. And then there was this whole orbiting astronomical observatory uh, a concept and actual observatory uh, uh, built and constructed. So uh, and these uh, might have had a lo longer life if they had been designed to be serviced, but certainly Hubble's planned litany of servicing missions helped it out when it really, really needed it right at the beginning of Hubble's, uh, what became Hubble's very long mission. Uh, thank you. Uh, our next question, uh, can observations be made simultaneously using more than one of the instruments? Yes, so um, Hubble has the capability of doing what we call um, parallel observations. So you can do one observation that you're intending to do with one instrument, but if you're, you know, happen to be pointing in an interesting direction for some other kind of science, you can do a parallel observation as well. We have another question uh, from a seventh grade student in Rockville who uh, is interested in aerospace engineering and uh, specifically in satellites. Uh, do you have any advice on the path uh, that they should take to get there? Sure. So, so I think the Hubble Space Telescope mission shows us how many different kinds of talents we need for this kind of uh, deep space exploration, even in astronomy. Obviously, we need engineers to design and and basically take care of the, the components of the telescope to make them work, to do the observations. We need scientists. We also need uh, computer specialists. We need those who can uh, manage big projects. We, know, we need those with expertise in financial management. We need those who are political leaders um, government leaders who can help advocate and orchestrate good productive science programs. We need teachers uh, who are good and, and capable of exciting students about what we're discovering in science and even to enter these fields. We need science communicators and writers and of course artists and people in the arts and humanities who can uh, think about the expressive natures of what we're seeing and those who think about the impacts of what we're discovering on other aspects and values of human life. Now you asked specifically about engineering. Um, I think of course studying mathematics, computers, and, and different types of sciences is very important to, for training, but also being learning how to be articulate in terms of writing and speaking. And I'm a big advocate of internships. So internships are available at many universities. Also NASA has a program and if you go to intern.nasa.gov you can learn about the internships programs. Uh, sometimes internships are available for high school students uh, but there are certainly internships available for university level students. These are wonderful ways to get short-term experiences working in fields of engineering or science, learning what people in engineering and science actually do and getting a sense as to where, whether and how you are interested in being involved in this kind of enterprise. So those are some of the things I would advocate. Great. Um, will there be future uh, servicing missions to the Hubble potentially with um, something like the Dragon spacecraft? Uh, that's a good question. So we, we can't service Hubble anymore by, with the space shuttle because the space shuttle program is no longer operating as NASA develops the new, its new uh, space transportation systems. And, and we're very excited actually about the Artemis program of returning humans for, for longer voyages beyond, beyond low earth orbit where the shuttle was confined and going back to the moon and, and, and hopefully to Mars. Um, but in the meantime, we can't service the Hubble telescope with the space shuttle. So we don't actually have any planned servicing for Hubble in the future, what our plans are, are to keep Hubble operating as well as possible for as long as we can, um, hopefully in complement with future telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope. And also astronomers are busy at work thinking about what would be a good platform that can do all the kinds of science 
that Hubble can do in visible light and ultraviolet light um, that the Webb telescope won't be able to do, but maybe a future Hubble-like platform that maybe is bigger than our current Hubble could do. So there's a lot of ideas going on right now of, of what we might do in, in the long-term future. Um, in the near term, there are some ideas being batted around in, in private industry and otherwise as to whether they could uh, possibly uh, do servicing on Hubble if that were to be desired, but that's not yet in NASA's official plans. But I know there's a lot of, of chatter and, uh, you know, a lot of interest and in, in creativity and zeal for this kind of thing. What lessons and skills uh, more broadly do you think we could learn from the, uh, the Hubble servicing missions? I think the Hubble servicing missions have shown us first how, um, how much more capability we have in space when we have the combination of humans and robotics. Um, because those missions used human astronauts in space, engineers on the ground, and some robotics like the, uh, the robotic arm that was on the space shuttle that helped pull in and manipulate this, the, space, uh, the, the, uh, the Hubble telescope into the space shuttle. That was just a taste of what we can do in the future by combining uh, human presence in space, robotics, um, perhaps artificial intelligence and and remote operations from the ground or from a, a, a space station. It's that combination of capabilities, skills, and talents that enabled Hubble servicing to work and will also, I think, enable uh, future missions, even construction in space, certainly long-term presence in space, and even enabling science, uh, different kinds of scientific platforms in space that are aided by having human maintenance, upgrades, and interaction. Hubble showed us it can be done. Um, it shows us that a space program doesn't have to be either only about humans physically moving beyond Earth or only about uh, non-human platforms looking deep into space or non-human probes, but somehow combining these different capabilities we get more return out than just the sum of its parts. This is a, maybe a question of more general interest. How can one obtain high-res images uh, from the Hubble? High-resolution images are easily available. That's one of the things I'm very proud of about the Hubble mission is that our scientific data, the, as well as the, the nicely um, processed images are all freely available. If you're interested in the images, you can, a good place to start is nasa.gov slash Hubble, which provides a nice portal to everything, including images. And also the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, which runs uh, the science, some of the daily science operations of the mission also has a website called hubblesite.org. And on that site, you can see also the news and images from Hubble. And if you go to the, the image uh, part of the news releases or the image part of the, the, the uh, website, you can see different resolution images available that you can download. So if you just want to look at something quickly, you can get a lower resolution image. If you're trying to print out something like a poster or something like that, you can get a much higher resolution image. And it's all free for you to use and enjoy. So what will happen to the Hubble uh, after its mission is finally over? Well, uh, I'm happy to say that that doesn't seem to be a near-term question because uh, I will say we have a champion group of engineers and technical experts on the ground at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore and various industry partners that are working very hard to address any technical glitches that come and go from time to time on Hubble and are keeping Hubble operating very well. In fact, we think we can operate Hubble even if things like its gyroscopes uh, start to uh, fail more and we get down to fewer than our nominal three, we still think we'll be able to point Hubble very well for years to come. So this is hopefully not a near-term issue, but eventually Hubble will no longer be scientifically productive. Uh, right now, NASA is pledging to support Hubble as long as it's scientifically productive. 
which we think is probably through this throughout this decade, maybe beyond. But at some point when it stops to being scientifically productive, when its instruments or its supporting infrastructure starts to fail, Hubble will be turned off, um, but it will still simply orbit the Earth for quite a while. Eventually, satellites do naturally deorbit when they are in low Earth orbit. And so eventually, um, in the coming decades, we will need to send something to Hubble to either deorbit it safely into the ocean or boost it up to what we call a parking orbit uh, high above low earth orbit and that decision has not been made yet in a it, when hubble was originally being designed there were thoughts of maybe returning the entire observatory to the ground for like a museum piece eventually um, it was decided over the years that that's really not a a good and practical use of of a space mission and astronaut uh, risking astronaut lives. But what we have been doing, as I mentioned earlier, is when the astronauts have gone to Hubble and brought down instruments, perhaps instruments that are famous for the images they have taken, um, we can display those in museums. And so right now you can see, for example, the, the wide field planetary camera two, which really achieved many of Hubble's famous images is at the Air and Space Museum, as well as the CoStar a corrective optics instrument. So we, we brought back some pieces, piece by piece, as well as part of the old solar panels that used to be on Hubble as well, um, have come down. And in that sense, we've, we've brought some of Hubble back to Earth uh, for us to uh, pay honor to. And then uh, as a follow-up and maybe a final question from there, uh, when Hubble does finally end its mission and closes its eye for the last time, uh, what will scientists miss that they might get from Hubble and not the other uh, space telescopes? Well, that's an excellent question. So we are working very hard now with the, the large international community of astronomers that advise us to make sure we're doing all the observations with Hubble now while we have it that we want to do so that in the future, when we don't have Hubble, we don't say, oh, why didn't we look at this? Or why didn't we do that? So. Um, some of Hubble's unique capabilities um, include ultraviolet light observations. Hubble is right now the only general purpose observatory in space that can receive ultraviolet light. And there are a lot of energetic phenomena in space that, that um, project or the, that emit their radiation in ultraviolet, like uh, stars and, and young stars and exploding stars, uh, for example, as well as measuring the, the, the content and the dynamics of the interstellar medium and the intergalactic medium. So we're using Hubble now quite a lot for ultraviolet light observations to collect the kinds of data that's not only useful for a particular project that a scientist wants to do right now, but maybe would be useful data to have in the archive for future types of studies where the ultraviolet observations of particular regions of the sky would be most useful. So that's one example of how we're trying to make sure we're doing the observations that are pretty unique to Hubble right now while we can um, so that we'll have that data in the future uh, and it will outlast the Hubble mission. Well, uh, thank you very much again, Dr. Weissman. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you here. Uh, before we end this meeting, uh, Dr. Good has uh, a few uh, items about our next week's uh, virtual triple talk. And so uh, we'll pass it on to Dr. Good. Thanks thank very you, much, everyone. John. And thank you also, Dr. Wiseman. Uh, I hope you've all enjoyed this lecture and uh, had a chance to ask any questions that you were interested in. Uh, please join us again next week on Thursday May 7th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time for a second lecture on the Hubble Space Telescope. Dr. Elizabeth Kessler from Stanford University will be speaking on Hubble Space Telescope and the Astronomical Sublime. Dr. Kessler's research focuses on 20th and 21st century American visual culture, especially the place of aesthetics, images, and media in astronomy. And I hope you'll keep your eyes open for future virtual Trimble lectures. And we also hope to have face-to-face -face, uh, in-person lectures again starting uh, in the fall. So thank you all for coming and come back again.